three ways to turn a house into a cash flowing machine. Hi, I'm Phil Pustiowski with FreedomMentor.com. I'm a full-time real estate investor, real estate mentor and coach to many of the most successful real estate investors all across North America, best-selling author of this book, How to Be a Real Estate Investor, and my newest bestseller, Real Estate Investing Gone Bad. This is a fantastic book, by the way. You'll love it. And thank you, thank you, thank you to all the viewers out there for making this the number one YouTube channel for real estate investors. This video, I think you're absolutely going to love it because I'm going to reveal to you three ways that you can turn a single family home into a cash flowing machine and you may or may not even have heard of these three techniques and even if you have, you may not understand just how powerful they can be. So before we dive into those three, I need to first explain to you the phrase highest and best use. That's what it was designed for, and that is as a primary residence for someone to live in, primary residence. Now this is critically important to investing, because if the highest and best use of a single family home is as a primary residence for someone to live in, then that explains what the best ways to typically make money on them are. And so for the most part, and I know it can differ depending on area, and we're going to get into this, but for the most part, a single family home is best monetized or profited from either if you're the builder, you, you build it from the ground up and then you sell it, or if you're a house flipper, you know, if you wholesale it, if you fix it up and resell it, that's typically the best way to make money on a single family home. And conversely, it's typically a lot more difficult to profit significantly from a single family home if you rent it out. Because that's not really its highest and best use. Now, by contrast, a multifamily such as a duplex, a triplex, a quad on up, five flexes on up, those were designed for renting out. So that is their highest and best use. Now you could live in one uh, side of a duplex or in one fourth of a quad, but still you're renting out the other units, that's their highest and best use. Single family homes, highest and best use, primary residence. So in this video, as I'm sharing with you these three techniques, what these do is these help overcome some of the problems with renting out a single family home. The existing occupant doesn't pay their rent, you're getting no money on that unit, which is a real problem because you still got taxes, you still got insurance, you still got maintenance, you might have management fees, and you also may have a big fat mortgage to pay as well. So the first major issue with renting out a single family home is just the occupancy is just one person and if they or, or, or one family. And so if they move out, you've got a real financial issue on your hands. And it's real easy to have one month vacancy removes all of the cash flow for the entire year on a single family home. Very common. So you, you have to have literally a 0% vacancy a lot of the times to make this thing work. Which, that's unrealistic. In the real world, renters don't always pay you. I've got a great video on what every landlord should know about property management. You need to check it out if you're ever going to rent property. It's incredibly important to have some of those foundational lessons uh, on the get-go before you get started. Okay, so number two, the other problem is that, and I'm going to use a, a commercial real estate term, they have low cap rates. What's a cap rate? All right, this is going to be a simple calculation that is going to be a great way for you to understand how to best assess how well something's going to cash flow as far as investment property is concerned. All right, here's what you do. First, we need to establish what the rental income is minus those expenses that are going to happen no matter what, whether you pay cash or not. So we're going to have, and I'm going to use for this example, I'm going to say we have $1,000 uh, that's the rent amount, okay? That's what the tenant is paying on their little single family home. Okay, now you got to pay taxes, right? There's your property taxes. We're going to say that's a hundred bucks. If you're in the state of Texas, you're going to say a hundred a month. Are you out of your mind, Phil? Triple that because in Texas, it's very expensive for property uh, taxes. Next, we have insurance. Let's say the insurance is $50. Okay, maybe it's a whole lot more, but let's, we'll just do this for the calculation, okay? <laughs> All right, so we've got taxes. 
we've got insurance, but there's more to a single family home cost. Let's say, for example, you have a property manager at 10%. I have a whole video on that as well, but we'll just, for the, for the sake of this example, we're gonna say $100 for the property manager, uh, but what else? Well, you may have this thing called maintenance, right? And so let's say that there's $100 and that's to save up for all the maintenance issues that may come up. And so once we get down here, what we get to is when you have the $1,000 rental minus these expenses, you come up with $650. Make sense? $650. In the, in the world of commercial real estate, they call that net operating income. NOI. But you know what you can think of it as? This is how much money you get at the end of uh, paying all these expenses when you get your rental money if you pay if you own it all cash how much can you actually spend what can you what can you go use for your own personal financial benefit and that's the 650 NOI okay all right so what do we do next we multiply the 650 by 12 months and you get right here $7800 okay so you got $7800 is what you get each uh, and every year after you've paid all your expenses, and that's assuming you don't have a mortgage, okay? Make sense? So you get your 780. All right, so now in order to determine cap rate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take whatever the total price of the property is, and we're gonna divide it by that 780. So the typical single family home that rents out for $1,000, now every part of the, the world is different, but let's say for this example, and it's very customary, it probably sells for about 150,000. That's probably what the, the the purchase price would be, and unless you got just the steal of a deal. So you take that 150,000, you take this 7,800, and here's what you get. You get this thing called cap rate, and the cap rate on this one is 5.2. 5.2. Okay, that's terrible. That's awful. If you were a real estate investor and you were doing commercial properties. Uh, 5.2, depending on your financing, is absolutely horrendous. For the majority of commercial real estate investors, they look for 10 caps or above uh, if they're an individual investor, they're not some institutional investor. Okay, so the cap rate is terrible. Why is it terrible? Because the cost to purchase that single family home is so much more than, the, than what the rental rate is. And why is that the case? What we talked about at the beginning, highest and best use. Single family homes are not designed to be cash flowing machines. They're typically designed to be a primary residence for somebody. All right, so having said that, now that you understand that single family homes by and large have two major problems, one is the occupancy and number two is these very low cap rates because of the, the relation between what's coming in, this uh, $1,000 a month versus the $150 you'd have to pay, that gives you an understanding that in order for a cash uh, for a house to be a cash flowing machine, you're going to have to get creative. So let's get creative. It's very important that we not change anything about the property itself. We want to keep it as a single family home in the way that it would be for someone to move in and purchase the property as their primary residence. That's critically important because that's one of the beautiful things about single family homes. They're liquid. There are so many prospective buyers of these kinds of properties that if you ever had to get out real quick and sell immediately, the beautiful thing about a single family home is you usually can. So. What I'm gonna describe with these three ways do not involve you maybe adding a mother-in-law suite or doing anything to the property to uh, improve the rental income, but then you start to, in, in a way, change what the primary of the highest and best use is, which is as a, as a residence. Okay, so the first idea, you can see it here, student housing. If the property is in proximity to a college, and you'd be surprised how many colleges there are. It's not just the big universities I'm talking about here. Sometimes there are small little niche colleges. I had an example of an apprentice I was talking to the other day that had a, had a dental school right near where, they're, uh, where they were located, and there just isn't enough housing for these dental students. So student housing near a college. What you have to do in most cases is you may have to put in some furniture because that can be a big deal for people in college. They don't have the money to go out and buy a bunch of furniture. But you can go to a secondhand store because they're not looking for the greatest furniture in the world. 
But when you do that, this is the key. You can rent by the room. Now, it is still going to be one lease, but from a pricing standpoint, you can price it by the room. So let's say this is a, uh, a four bedroom, you know, you, you could rent that for say $500, you know, per room, which totals 2000 Now right there, if we go back to the previous example, we were at a normal rate of 1000 Okay, so that was, that was market rate, as if you were going to just rent it the normal way. But now all of a sudden you can get 2000 because you threw some furniture in there and you market it directly to a local college. Now, the other problem with the college angle is you do have to time it right because there usually are certain times of year that those students are looking for their housing and once they get it locked in, they're locked in for the year. So that's a problem. So timing is an issue. I got a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, timing is an issue. And I'm not worried about them partying. I've had student housing. I don't right now because I'm in Florida. I'm not near a college. But uh, when I was in Nashville, I did. You know, it works out pretty darn well. And here's the greatest part for me as a landlord. You get the parents to co-sign. You know, so when you get parental co-signing, that's when you're in great condition. Because if they don't pay you, you're going to get paid because the parents have co-signed. So, love student housing. It allows you to crank up the rental rate quite a bit. If you market it correctly to the right people, throw some furniture in there, you may even, it might cost a little bit, you may even offer free internet or free Wi-Fi and, and cable TV, that sort of thing, so that you're, that you're appealing to that audience, but it doesn't cost nearly as much as, uh, as the extra thousand you're going up to. So that's a great way to turn into a cash flow machine, and then they'll pass it down for their friends and friends and friends. It could be the, uh, the cool off-campus house for the next 25 years. So student housing, wonderful way to turn a house into a cash flowing machine. Number two is the vacation rental. I absolutely love this. I have a great video on this um, about vacation rentals, how to buy them correctly, what to do with them. So you can check that out. Actually, I'll put that here on the screen for you to check out. For this example, what I want to share with you is that most vacation rentals, you're renting by the night. Now, it does depend on the area, and you may have a minimum number of nights, and there may be some laws related to you getting the right licensing for it. So obviously check that out. But by the night, what can end up happening is, especially a four bedroom, you can rent out for quite a bit more per night than even a three or a two because you can get bigger families in there. And this can easily go into a position of $4,000 a month. Very, very easily. I have several vacation rentals. It's amazing. The difference between, you know, kind of your normal rental rate of a thousand that you would get per month the, the normal way at, and then what you do as a vacation rental when you're going by the night. It's incredible. Now, there are a couple of expenses that we need to clarify. Um, number one, you've got the, the, you've got the expense of furniture. And when you're dealing with the vacation rental, furniture is a little bit more expensive because you're going to have a little bit nicer stuff and you want to get good reviews and those kind of things. So furniture is going to be a little bit more expensive, maybe ten, twenty thousand $20,000 in some cases, depending on where you're at. Um, but if you've got the right furniture in there, you've got the right property, it's super nice, then you're, you're going to just, I mean, if you're booking up at $4,000 a month, you've got some money to pay for that kind of stuff. It'll pay itself back quickly. Now, you've also got to pay uh, utilities. And now that can be a big one to pay on the house. I mean, utilities can really hit you. And I'm not talking about just uh, gas and, and water and electricity. I'm also talking about internet and, in, in some cases, cable. Although these days, if the internet is good enough, you can do one of those uh, systems whereby it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the television is coming through the internet. You know, there's some services that do that. Okay, so furniture, utilities, I mean, these are extra expenses, but these things can throw off so much money. So much money. It's wonderful. And so what ends up happening is we, in, earlier in the video, we were talking about cap rates, right? Now, when we were given the an original example of $1,000 a month, I think we had a cap rate of like 5.2. But then we showed with the student housing, we could take it up to $2,000 a month. And there might be slightly more expenses if you want to throw in internet. But that pretty much doubles your cap rate, if not triples. So your cap rate all of a sudden goes to, to 10 plus with a, with a student rental. Uh, but you get to a vacation rental, 
Now all of a sudden your, your, your cap rate can go to 20 plus. I mean, we're talking huge, huge cap rates. Amazing. Now I also love about vacation rentals is they're in and they're out. You're not worrying about eviction because they're on vacation. So it's amazing from that perspective as well. You're not dealing with having to get eviction attorneys involved and paying for all that mess. It's fantastic. You've got so much money coming in, you can afford some of the hassles that come along with people coming in and out. I mean, little things will break, those sorts of things. But so what? You've got the money to pay for it. This turns a single family home into a cash flowing machine. Now, I live on the beach in Florida, and so many of the properties around here, you can't just do the normal rental because all the owners have figured this out. It's so obvious. Why would you do a normal rental when you can do a vacation rental and make so much more money? Okay, so that's number two. Number three is the rent to own. This is fantastic. I have built my career on this technique. I've made a fortune doing it. And the greatest part is so few people do it. It's because they don't know about it. They don't understand it. They're concerned because there's not a lot of people to call and ask for help. But this technique is humongous because for the, mo the most part, student housing and vacation renting is not an option. There's not a school nearby and it's not a vacation destination. So what do you do in that case to turn that house into a cash flowing machine? You offer it on a rent to own. Here's how it works. Number one, you're going to get an up front, non-refundable, Option payment. Option payment. What this means is when they first move in, they're getting a lease with you. That's one document, it's the lease. And the second document is an option to purchase the property at a specified price when they move in. And to get that option, they're going to pay you up front. How much is that going to be? That could be anywhere from on the low end about 5000 on up. You can get 10000 or more. My record is $18,000. <laughs> so, um, but anywhere in that range. And yes, you can settle for 2000 if you want to, but if you're good at marketing, you can find a lot more than that. You wouldn't believe how many people have mattress money. They've got $5,000, especially right now when this video is being shot during tax return season when they're getting a tax refund. This is a huge time of year for the rent to own. Okay, so when you offer a rent to own, you get this option payment, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, fantastic. The next thing is you push all maintenance on the tenants so there's no more maintenance. They're becoming the owner. So if something goes bad, hey, they're, they're becoming the owner of the house. That's all them. You literally can push every bit of maintenance off on them. Now, there are certain landlord and tenant laws that somehow uh, will supersede this. I've learned this the hard way, such as when an air conditioning system goes out and they're able to look at the Landlord and Tenant Act and be able to prove to me that even though they signed an agreement that said they'd fix it, I still have to fix it. All right, that can happen. But for the most part, you can push all the maintenance off on the tenant. So that just saved you $100 a month in our previous example in, in, uh, in management. And in, in, in another $100 a month as it relates to, uh, uh, to fixing things up. You're saving money with a rent to own because when there's no maintenance issues, because the tenant deals with it, you don't get calls from them. It's not a property management headache anymore. They're handling it. Okay, so upfront money, no maintenance, and here's the next thing higher rental amount. Now let me explain. I've got to I've got to explain this because it's not a higher rental amount normally unless you structure your rent to own intelligently. Here's how it works. When you do a rent to own, for the most part, the people are going to expect to pay at or below rental rate. So normally, even if you offer a rent to own, they're not going to want to pay more than our example $1000 a month. Okay, but what you can do is this. You can offer what's called rent credits. Not every state allows this. An example would be Texas and a few others, but you can offer rent credits almost everywhere. And what rent credits do is allow you to raise the rental rate. So follow me. If it's normally a thousand dollars a month, you bump it up to say $1,200 a month. 
1200 a month, and then you give them a rent credit of, say, $300 a month. Now, you may, you may be thinking, but, but wait a minute, Phil. Uh, you raised it by $200, but you're going to give them a $300 rent credit? All right, here we go. Here's the big secret to rent to owns. Big secret. Ready for this? Over 90% of the people that will do a rent to own will never exercise their option to purchase. They are not going to buy it in almost all cases. Don't worry, you're not going to sell your home almost ever. Why? It's because that's the way people are. They typically don't have a better financial situation tomorrow than they do today for the most part. People that aren't watching videos like this, they're not trying to improve their financial life, right? So. What happens is they have this optimism when they move in that they're going to become the owner. They're going to be able to get a loan. Everything's going to work out. Credit's going to improve. Their job's going to give them a raise. All these great things are going to happen. But then a year goes by and it hasn't happened. In fact, they've had a couple of emergencies come up and they've got a daughter that's now in jail that they had to bail out and they had this problem, they had that problem. And these issues occur and next thing you know, they're in a worse financial position than they were before, despite all the work you may have done to try to help them. You may have tried to help them with credit repair services, you may have gotten in touch with a mortgage broker, you may have done all those things and they still are unable to do it. That's, that is a it is a fact of facts in this business. So what happens is, your rent to own, you would rather gamble on raising the rental rate and giving them a big fat rent credit for doing so because you know more than they do about the future because you know that 90% of the time, sometimes more, that what's going to happen here is they're not going to exercise the option and your extra $200 a month is positive cash flow. So what's happened here is we've gotten rid of maintenance, we've raised cash flow, all of a sudden this cap rate is approaching 10. It's getting close to 10. But then you add this puppy in, that nice down payment, and all of a sudden your cap rate is now maybe 12 to 15. So you see how this becomes a cash flowing machine as well. Slightly different than the other two, but this can apply everywhere. I'll tell you this, every single family home that's not a vacation rental, that's not a student housing that I've ever done, I always do a rent to own. Always. What's the worst case scenario? They buy it. And if they buy it, well, I've put the price up at a high price, so I, I make a lot of money. So it's a win-win no matter what. And what. Okay, so what? So maybe one out of your ten, you end up selling it, and then you, you take that extra money, what, you go to go buy another property. It's okay. I also love the fact here that I've got this money up front and that can help if there is a problem and the person stops paying, you have to evict them, right? You have to, you have to, if you have to evict them, you've got the money to do it. you got the money to pay the attorneys to replace the carpet, replace the paint. It's wonderful. The rent to own is so exciting because so few people do it. I, th this is going to blow your mind, but here's the reality. If you put up a sign, I'm going to show you what the sign looks like. Here's, your, here's what you do. You put a sign up. You can just test it. Don't even, don't even have a house. Just test this. Put up a sign that says rent to own in big letters on the top. Put no banks needed at the bottom. And then you can put like 3-2 home here and put your phone number. You put some signs up like that around town, you'll get hundreds of of phone calls. Hundreds. I'm not kidding. You're going to have to set up a different phone because it will ring off the hook. It's crazy. Rural areas, urban areas, it doesn't matter. It's because there's a huge population of people that want to rent to own their own home and almost no one offers it. So when you do it, it's just going to be a bonanza of phone calls. Now, the majority of those people don't have a job, don't have the money, don't have the ability to do it. So you're going to have to filter through potentially hundreds of, of phone calls. Now, what I do is I take them to a voicemail, and that voicemail is very clear. It says, you know, you've got to have at least $5,000 to put down, and you've got to be willing to uh, at least to $4,000 a month. If you can, leave your, leave your information. So you're going to have to filter these people because you're going to get hundreds of phone calls. But the exciting thing is you won't have an issue with potential people. There's no concern over uh, the dearth of people that want to do a rent to own. So this right here, this technique alone, could greatly improve your cash flow moving forward every time you have a single family home.
And I think it is a bedrock of any creative real estate investor that they offer rent to owns. This will build you all kinds of wealth because when these people move out, you move somebody else in, move somebody else in. Always getting that big fat down payment up front and you're also getting, in most cases, you're getting additional um, income that you normally would on the rental rate because you can bump it up and you have less maintenance. All right, so those are the three ways to turn a house into a cash flowing machine. Student housing, vacation rental, both of those may not fit for the majority of single family homes, but you can always do a rent to own. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you got any questions, feel free to make some comments down below. I try to carve out time out of my schedule to answer those questions. Uh, feel free to go to our website, freedommentor.com, to learn more about my apprentice program and how I work with people individually to help them become cash flowing machines themselves. Uh, if you haven't already, grab my new book, Real Estate Investing Gone Bad. This is a winner. And please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't already because I put out some amazing videos, some of which only the subscribers can see. All right, well, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you on the next video.